All right, so let's move on to our next session, which we're going to be discussing the major synovial joints. The first major synovial joints that we are discussing today is this will be the shoulder joint. And as you see on here, the shoulder joint is going to be formed by the articulation of two bones that we've seen previously. Those are my humerus and the scapula. To be more accurate, this will be formed mainly by the articulation between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity of the scap. Can you remind me what kind of synovial joint is this? Like if you have the head and the glenoid cavity, this will be a ball and socket exactly. Ball and socket joint that will allow you to have a maximum range of movement compared to any other type of synovial joints that we've mentioned. So because I have a loose cavity of my on here formed by the glenoid cavity it's a loose cavity it's shallow so I uh, I need to have a lot of reinforcements for my shoulder for my shoulder joint to prevent any dislocation from taking place and that's why you're gonna see large group of muscles that will be surrounding the head of the humerus attaching the scapula to the humerus. One of those muscles will be the biceps and as you see on here on the diagram on your slide this will be the tendon of the long head of the triceps. See we're gonna have also a, lot, a group of muscles that will be surrounding my humerus all around like for example my deltoid muscle the muscle of your shoulder a rotator cuff muscles those are this is a group of muscles that will be surrounding the humerus as well what can I see here I see many ligaments attaching different parts of bond many tendons and ligaments surrounding my shoulder joint and that's this will tell you why I have this large number of bursae in between. Remember, why do I have a bertha? What's a bertha? A bertha is a flattened sac filled with synovial fluid. And why do I need to have a bursa in between the ligaments and the bones? For the bones, when they move, they don't cause any inflammation of my ligaments. Looking down in here, you see how shallow is a glenoid cavity if you compare it for example to the other example of the ball and socket joints that we've mentioned this would be the acetabulum and the head of the femur of course the glenoid cavity is shallow compared to my acetabulum which will make the shoulder at a higher risk of developing dislocation compared to my hip joint looking on another type of synovial major synovial joints that we have this would be my elbow joint and as you see on here the elbow joint is going to be formed by the articulation of three bones not two bones this time you have the trochlea if i'm drawing here the humerus this is how the humerus will look like those are my medial epicondyles this is the trochlea this would be the capitulum the capitulum if you remember back from the bones is going to be articulating with the head of the radius and the trochlea is going to be articulating with the trochlear notch of my own can you remind me what kind of synovial joint do i have between the trochlea and the trochlear notch of the ulna yeah you have a cylindrical shaped Articular surface, which is my trochlea. You have the trochlear notch, which is going to be concave. So, this tells you what, which type of synovial joints will be formed of a cylindrical shaped bony articular surface articulating with another concave articular surface. This would be my hinge joint. So, the first type of synovial joints that we're going to have here forming my elbow joints this will be my hinge joint between 
the trochlea of the humerus and the trochlear notch of the ulna. The other joint that we can see on here, this will be the plane joint between the two flat surfaces, one of the capitulum and the other one of the head of the radius. So actually we have two joints here forming my elbow. Hinge joint between the trochlea and the trochlear notch and the plane joint between the capitulum and the head of the radius. As you see on here, you're going to have also a thick fibrous joint capsule. Also, many ligaments here will be attaching the three bones together for them to be reinforced and to prevent the joint dislocation. What do you think is the type of synovial joints that allows gliding motion? Can you remind me? If I have, yes, exactly, two flat surfaces, this is the type of joints that will allow me to have a gliding motion. So, and what synovial joint is it formed of two flat surfaces articulating together? This is my exactly plane joint. So, my answer here would be a plane joint. Moving on to another major synovial joint that we have, this would be the hip joint. And if you remember, a hip joint is going to be formed by the head of the femur articulating with this cavity here. This is my acetabulum, exactly. And if you remember, which one is deeper, your acetabulum or your the glenoid cavity of your scapula? Yeah, of course, the acetabulum is much deeper, which will make the hip joint more, more stable compared to my shoulder joint. So the shoulder joint is more likely to be dislocated compared to the hip joint. If we're looking on here, what kind of joint is it formed? What is the head of the femur? looks like yeah it looks like a ball and how the acetabulum looks like it looks like a socket so what kind of synovial joint is this one yeah exactly this is my ball and socket joint can you remind me is this a uniaxial biaxial non-axial or multi-axial joint you can perform flexion extension of a ball and socket. You can perform abduction, adduction. You can perform medial lateral rotations. All those means you are moving along more than two planes. So this means I am looking at a multi-axial joint. Remember the type of synovial joints that provides you with the maximum range of movement, this would be my ball and socket joint. If you see here, surrounding the edge of my acetabulum, you're going to have a very dense, if I remove here, let me remove this for you. Yeah, so you see here, I have a very dense fibrous joint capsule, which actually will give more depth to my acetabulum. Why it's so important to have a very deep acetabulum? Yeah, because this is a joint, this is a joint that will be holding all your body weight down to your thigh, to your legs. So very important to have a very strong and stable joint. And this actually will be reducing my ability and the range of my movement. If I'm looking to the next major synovial joint that we have, this would be my knee joint. And if you remember, what kind of joints do I have in here? You see those elliptic shaped articular surfaces articulating together. One is convex and the other side would be concave. This is what we've called an ellipsoid or condyloid joint. How many of those do we have? We have two joints, medial and lateral condyles of the femur will be articulating with the medial and lateral condyles of my 
tibia. So you have actually two condyloid or ellipsoid joints forming your knee. Also, in the knee, we're going to have a plain joint which is going to be located between the patella and the patellar surface here of my femur. So, how many joints do you have inside forming your knee? You have two condyloid or ellipsoid joints, you have one plain joint. So, to gain two condyloid or ellipsoid joints, those are located between the medial and lateral condyles of the femur, articulating with the medial and lateral condyles of the tibia. My plain joint here will be the articulation of the two flat surfaces, one on my patella and the other one is going to be on the patellar surface of my femur, like what you see on here. I have many ligaments to support my knee joint and if you can see from inside why do I need a lot of support here to prevent any dislocation from taking place so like what ligaments here will share in stabilizing my knee joint like my cruciate ligaments for example you see here two ligaments that would be forming across those are my anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments ACL and PCL and again why do I need much reinforcement for my synovial joints because you do have space between the articulating bones and those joints would be more likely to be dislocated than the cartilaginous the fibrous joints so I need lots of support in here what gives me a reinforcement in the knee joint would be the different ligaments including my PCL and ACL also you're gonna have ligaments that will be attaching the femur to the bones of my leg from the sides so on the medial side you're gonna have a ligament that will be attaching the medial epicondyle of the femur down here if you see to my tibia and this other one that will be attaching my lateral epicondyle of the femur to my fibula. We call the one that will be attaching the tibia to the fibula on the lateral side of the knee. This will be my fibular collateral ligament. And the one that will be attaching the medial epicondyle to the tibia, this will be my tibial collateral ligament ligament so let me mark here important ligaments we need to know that will be supporting or sharing in the support of my of my knee joint we're gonna have PCL ACL we're gonna have the fibular collateral ligament and the tibial collateral ligament also we're gonna have a tendon here coming down from my quadriceps femoris and as this tendon surrounds my patella and keeps going down to be attached to the tibial tuberosity of my tibia, we call this tendon that would be formed coming out of the patella. This is my patellar ligament. So all those ligaments, as you see on here, will share in the support and reinforcement of my knee joint. Moving on to our next synovial joint this would be my temporal or TMG temporal mandibular joint and of course this would be the articulation between my temporal bone and my mandibular condyle of the mandible so you see on here what's going to be articulating you're going to have the condyle of the mandible this is my mandibular condyle it articulates with the mandibular fossa of my temporal bone and this is what allows you to open and close your mouth also to allows you to allow to move to perform an outward movement of your mandible a backward movement of your mandible can you remind me what did we call those movements a forward movement of the mandible this is what we call a 
roll traction and the backward movement of the mandibles this is my retraction also I would have two flat surfaces one in my mandibular condyle and the other one will be in my mandibular fossa of the temporal bone and this also will allow me to move my mandible from side to side like this what am I moving here? I am moving the two flat surfaces of the mandibular condyle and the mandibular fossa against each other which will allow me again to move my mandible from side to side so what kinds of joints can I see on here first you're gonna have a hinge joint and this will allow the depression and elevation of the mandible which gonna be the represented here if you go back to the special movements when you close your mouth this is elevation of the mandible when you open your mouth this would be by depression of the mandible so again again this is what kind of joints that will allow you to open and close your mouth this is the hinge joint between the temp the mandibular condyle and the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. Also, we're going to have a gliding motion here, a gliding movement that would be might be taking place if you decided to move your mandible from side to side by articulating the two flat surfaces, one on your mandibular condyle and the other one on the on the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. Very important, very important, very important to remember that the temporomandibular joint is the most easily dislocated joint in your body. It's easier even compared to my shoulder joint. Remember, I need reinforcement to support and stabilize my joints. So if we're looking here, if we're comparing the temporomandibular joint to my shoulder joint, you're going to see that the shoulder joint has much more reinforcement. You're going to have pectoralis major on here passing to get attached to the humerus. You're going to have the deltoid muscle. You're going to have the rotator cuff muscles. All those muscles are providing support to my shoulder joint. So it's less likely to be dislocated if I compare it to something like the temporomandibular joint in which I don't have much muscles to support. I don't have much ligaments to support. I have few muscles, few ligaments that will be providing me with the reinforcement needed. That's why the temporomandibular joint will be the easiest, the most easily dislocated joint of the body. Moving on, so what do you think is the type of synovial joint that allows opposition? Can you remind me? Yeah, what did we call this type of synovial joints that we do have between the metacarpal bone and the carpal bone of the thumb? Yeah, yes, this would be my saddle joint. Saddle joint. Moving on to homeostatic imbalances that will be related to the the joints first would be the common joint injuries first common joint injury will be the sprains and sprains are due to ligaments which are stretched or torn a partial tear can heal by itself but a complete rupture of a tendon or a ligament needs a surgical repair so if you have a complete rupture of a ligament it cannot heal on its own you need to interfere by performing a surgery another type of joint injuries that we're looking at today is this would be the cartilage tears and the cartilage tears usually due to compression or shear stress the problem here with the cartilage fracture or cartilage tears would be that the cartilage is so hard to heal. Why is the cartilage so hard to heal? Simply because the cartilage tissue is avascular. It doesn't have blood vessels. So I'm getting 
very minimum amount of nutrients, very minimum amount of oxygen. So it's, it's much more difficult for me to heal compared to, for example, another tissue like your bone tissue. Cartilage rarely repairs itself and in some cases I will need an arthroscopic surgery to be performed. What's arthro? Arthro means something related to joints. And scope, scope means vision. So if I'm looking by a camera inside a joint cavity to perform the surgery, I'm using an arthroscope. Arthro, again, joint and scope is vision. So if I'm looking by a camera to see the inside of a joint, this would be my arthroscope and this would be called my arthroscopic surgery. You see on here, uh, this patient got a trauma from the lateral aspect of the knee and this caused a rupture, complete rupture of the cruciate ligaments. Also, I've had a rupture. What did we call this ligament that attaches my medial epicondyle of the tibia uh, of the femur to the tibia on here? Yeah, this is my tibial collateral ligament. Also, it's torn in this case. And I have a fracture here of the medial meniscus. Can you remind me what are the menisci? Menisci are pads of cartilage that we do have in the knee. We have the medial meniscus, lateral meniscus. So what kind of cartilage is it located in the menisci of the knee? Can you remind me? You need to absorb compressive shock in your knees. So what kind of cartilage again? Yeah, fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is a type of cartilage located here in my menisci. So if we're looking on here, we can see a fragment did move away from its normal alignment. And this is what we're going to be calling here the cartilage tear. Is it easy to heal on its own? No, it's not. Why again? Because cartilage is avascular. It might require a arthroscopic surgery. Other common, other common joint injuries would be dislocations or luxation. A dislocation means that you did force the bones out of their normal alignment. So I did, for example, move the head of the humerus out of the glenoid cavity. I did move, for example, the head of the femur out of the acetabulum. So at this point, we would call this misalignment of the bones forming the joints. This is what we call again luxation or dislocation. This would be, of course, accompanied by sprains, inflammation, and joint immobilization. Why do you think? You did pull the head of the humerus out of the glenoid cavity, and this head of the humerus is going to be surrounded by a large group of muscles, large group of tendons and ligaments. So what you're going to do with, with those ligaments, you're going to be overstretching them. And because of the overstretch, some of them will be torn. And what happens when you tear a ligament? This creates an inflammation. And inflammation, what are the card different cardinal signs of any inflammation that you know? Yes, swelling, red, hot, and most importantly, will be painful. So if you have pain when you move your shoulder, would you like to keep moving it and have this pain? Of course not. So a dislocation would be accompanied by sprains, would be accompanied by inflammation, and as a result of the inflammation, we will have pain, which will result in and immobilization of the joint. So you cannot move your joints simply because it's painful. What do you think might cause a dislocation if, for example, I did fall in the playground with an, an extended arm and it fell like this? 
So this will be pushing the head of the humerus out of the glenoid cavity. I've got dislocation of the shoulder joint. Uh, an accident, car accident, which forced the head of the femur out of the acetabulum. So I get a dislocation of the head joint and so on. So each one would have its, its specific circumstances. Again, can you remind me which joint is most easily to be dislocated out of all the synovial joints that we have? I have minimum support, minimal reinforcement of those joints. Would be my temporomandibular joints. Temporomandibular joints. Subluxation is a partial dislocation. I don't have a complete misalignment. I don't have I did not totally force the bone out of the neuromal alignment. It is a subluxation rather than a luxation or a dislocation. Moving on to another homeostatic imbalance that would be related to the joints. This would be my birthitis. And whenever you hear bursa, what comes to your mind? Yeah, this is your flattened sacs formed by synovial membranes and filled by synovial fluid. And where did we have those bursae? Yeah, they are located between the ligaments and the bones. And what was the function here of having those sacs filled with synovial fluid? They would be reducing the friction between the ligament and your bones. What if I see itis? Itis means inflammation, exactly. So when I say bursitis means I am having inflammation of my burst. What might cause an inflammation of those flattened sacs between the ligaments and the bone? It might be due to friction, exaggerated friction. So I kept sitting like this in class. I have bursi here in my elbow. I'm applying lots of pressure all the time on the bursi of my elbow. So what I will end up with, I will end up with a student's elbow, which is a bursitis, inflammation of the bursi of my, of my elbow because of the frequent irritation and friction I'm applying to those bursi. How would I treat a bursitis? Rest, ice, and I would be given non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications first, and then if it's not resolved by using NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, I might go to a more aggressive way of management, which is going to be the use of corticosteroids. But most likely, it will be resolved with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Same concept for my tendonitis. What's a tendon sheath? Yeah, tendon sheath is a flattened bursi that will be surrounding your tendons and this will reduce the friction between the tendons of the muscles and the bones they are passing over. But what if you decided to go to the gym today and you decided so your your trainer they tell you yeah you need to train your biceps today having 10 counts and four groups for this training you decided no I won't do this I would be doing 100 counts and 10 groups so what's gonna happen ah tendonitis inflammation of the tendon sheath of the biceps tendon. Why? Because of the overuse of your tendon sheath. So yes, this tendon sheath reduces the friction, but if you are overusing your tendon, you keep irritating the tendon sheath and it will get inflamed itself because just of your overuse. So how will I will I be dealing? How will I deal with a tendonitis the same way like I will deal with bursitis? How did I deal with bursitis? Rest, ice, and giving 
NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Moving on to arthritis. If you remember, what's arthro? Arthro means joint. And this is our chapters that we're discussing today. So arthro is a joint and itis, itis means inflammation. So inflammation of the joint. So this is not a disease. This is a large group of disorders. This is not a single disease. This is not one single problem. We do have more than a hundred types of arthritis. What are the general manifestations and the general symptoms of arthritis? Like any inflammation again, you're gonna have swelling, you're gonna have tenderness, pain, you're gonna have stiffness, you're not able to move the joints like what you used to. We're gonna have acute forms and chronic forms. Acute means it has a sudden onset. So you were fine yesterday and all of a sudden you got an inflammation of your joint. This is a sudden abrupt uh, onset of an arthritis. So most likely what causes an acute arthritis is going to be a bacterial infection. So usually we treat most of the acute arthritis by giving antibiotics to treat the bacterial infection of the joint. Chronic arthritis, chrono, chrono means, chrono means, if I told you to put something in a chronological order, chrono, chrono means time, time. So here, chronic disease, chronic arthritis, chrono, chrono is time, it takes time. It doesn't have a sudden onset. So this patient did have a problem in his knee for the last 20 years. Now it's getting worse. All of a sudden, it's getting worse. Mm. Is it all of a sudden or is it gradual? Yeah, it's gradual. It's gradual. It's not all of a sudden like what we've seen with the acute arthritis. So chronic arthritis develop over years, months, but it doesn't have a sudden onset. Like what chronic forms of arthritis, like osteoarthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, and gouty arthritis. Moving on to the osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis, so what I can understand here just from the name, we're looking, breaking down the name here of the disease. Osteo, osteo means something related to bone and arthro is joint and itis is an inflammation so what can i understand here this is an inflammation of the bone and the joint bone and joint osteoarthritis what can we understand about osteoarthritis is that it's common it's irreversible it's a degenerative arthritis what i mean by degenerative arthritis it's a normal aging process. So it will take place with every single person on different levels. So some people might not get it, but most of the people will get it when they get older. This will tell you why 85% of all Americans develop osteoarthritis. It's much more common in women than in men. What happens in an osteoarthritis, if I'm drawing here, this is my knee joint, let's say, this is my hiding cartilage covering the articular surface of my condyle, of the medial condyle, let's say, of the femur, and this is the condyle here of the tibia that articulates with it. It's also covered by a cartilage, hiding cartilage. And you're going to have this space filled by synovial fluid. What we see in the osteoarthritis is destruction here of the articular cartilage. So you're going to have, you're going to be breaking down the cartilage. 
covering the articulating bones. And if you did break down the cartilage, what's going to happen? You're going to be exposing the bone to articulate with another bone tissue. Is the bone capable to form a joint directly without being covered with, with cartilage? Hmm. It cannot. So what happens to the bone also is going to be broken down and those bone ends, those exposed bone ends will be responding to the irritation by thickening, enlarging and will form tiny tiny bone parts inside the joint cavity like this. This is what we're going to be calling here this is my bone spurs. And if I have bone parts inside the joint cavity, would I be able to move my joint freely? Mm -mm. You see on here, if I have bone in between my articulating bones, this will restrict my movement. So I would have restricted movement and this will tell you why person with osteoarthritis wouldn't have a restricted movement because of the formation of tiny bone particles inside the joint space. Treatment of the osteoarthritis would be to perform moderate activity. What do you think? If a person came to you with osteoarthritis of the knee, what exercise should you recommend him? Would you let him run a marathon? Uh, to go to the gym, weight-bearing exercises or what? What do you think? You want a type of activity that enhances the muscle strength at the same time doesn't apply much pressure on the joint. So what is the best activity that he can perform without applying much pressure on his knee which, is, which has osteo arthritis. Swimming. Yeah, exactly. So if I'm swimming, I'm not applying much pressure on my knee joint. At the same time, I'm activating my muscles to provide more support to the affected, to the affected joints. So swimming here would be a very good recommendation for a patient with osteo osteoarthritis. We're going to be also treating them by mild pain relievers we're going to be in trying to enhance the formation of the synovial fluid trying to lubricate a little this friction taking place in the affected joints by giving them glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate moving on to another type of chronic of chronic arthritis this would be my rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease what's autoimmune auto auto like automobile auto means self and autoimmune means the immune system is attacking your self tissues so rather than attacking a foreign Passogen, passogen bacteria come from outside, the virus come from outside, then my immune system now start to recognize my self antigens as non-self. So I started to attack myself. This is an autoimmune disease. I don't have a def we don't know a definitive reason for rheumatoid arthritis, but it usually arises at the age between 40 to 50 years of age. It's more common in females than in males. Signs include joint pain, swelling, and this is common with any kind of arthritis, but what is special here about rheumatoid arthritis is that it takes place bilaterally. What I mean by bilaterally, it's affecting both sides, right and left joints. So if I have uh, rheumatoid arthritis of my uh, interphalangeal joints or metacarpophalangeal joints, 
This will be taking place in both right and left hands in, on both sides. It's a bilateral arthritis affecting both sides. And why do you think it's taking place bilaterally affecting both sides? It's not affecting one side because simply what causes the disease is circulating in your blood. You have immunoglobulins, you have antibodies released by your immune system. Those immunoglobulins are reaching both right and left sides of your body. So this disease will be manifested bilaterally. Also, I would have anemia, I would have osteoporosis, I would have muscle weakness, cardiovascular problems. Why do you think you have multiple system engagements? Why many systems would be affected by rheumatoid arthritis? Simply because it's not only a disease of joints, it's an autoimmune disease. You have immunoglobulins, you have antibodies produced by your immune system that will be attacking not only your joints, it's gonna, they will be attacking many other different organs at the same time, including your blood cells, including your bone cells, including your uh, cardiac muscle cells, and so on. So many organs will be involved here in rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is not only a joint problem, it's a systemic problem. It's affecting more than one organ system in the same time. And this is why I will see involvement of the blood cells. I will see involvement of the cardiac cells. I will see involvement of the skeletal muscle cells and so on. So if I'm looking here, what is a major problem here for rheumatoid arthritis that those patients will be facing would be major deformity of the affected joints. So you see here, those are affected metacarpophalangeal joints in this patient. And you see here, I have major deformity of the joints. How would I treat patients of rheumatoid arthritis? First, we're going to be using conservative therapy. This includes aspirin. We're going to be recommending long-term use of antibiotics. Why do you think you will be providing antibiotics? Give you a second to think of it. What actually did enhance your immune system to become activated is a bacteria or an infection of any kind. So if I didn't get an infection, my immune system will not become activated and it will not be producing the immunoglobulins that will travel to affect my own tissues. So if I did prevent or reduce the infection taking place in my body by getting long-term antibiotics, this will reduce my risk of developing attacks later on of rheumatoid arthritis because simply what activates your immune system to release the immunoglobulins, to release the antibodies into your bloodstream is going to be the infection. So if you reduce the risk, if you reduce the infection rate, this will reduce the risk of developing attacks of the rheumatoid arthritis, inflammation of the joints. Also, we're going to be recommending a physical therapy to maintain the mobility of the affected joints. So I don't want this patient to have permanent deformities of the affected joints and restricted movement for the rest of his life. So we're going to be recommending him to get physical therapy to enhance the movement of the affected joints. We're going to be using progressive treatment in case of severe attacks during the progress of the disease. Progressive treatment, this includes more, uh, 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 stronger, I'm sorry, stronger kind of therapies like using immunosuppressants, using corticosteroid rather than aspirin, which is a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So we're going to be using much stronger medications in a progressive, in a sudden attack of rheumatoid arthritis. OK, 
currently there is new biological response modifier drugs which are going to be trying to neutralize the effect of the immunoglobulins but this is still under research we don't have like a medication that we get to prevent the immunoglobulins that are attacking our own tissues and to not prevent the immunoglobulins that are attacking the bacteria itself so we still didn't reach this kind of advancement in the preparation of those drugs what do you think is another name for a dislocated hip remember dislocation another word that describes dislocation is luxation luxation and what was a partial dislocation this is my sub luxation subluxation is a partial dislocation moving on to our last topic here this will be and last homeostatic imbalance that would be related to the joints this would be my gouty arthritis gouty arthritis is caused by high blood levels of uric acid and where do i get the uric acid from uric acid actually is going to be resulting from the breakdown of the nucleotides forming the RNA and DNA so if I have large amounts of DNA and RNA that are broken down this will increase the uric acid content in my in my blood and as I increase the amount of uric acid circulating in my bloodstream this uric acid can be filtered into the fluid in between the articulating bones of my synovial joints can you remind me what was the name of the fluid inside your synovial joints yeah synovial fluid so if you increase the amount of uric acid in the synovial fluid of of the joints what's going to happen to this uric acid this uric acid will start to form crystals inside your joint cavity and try to imagine that you are wearing a shoe wearing shoes and inside those shoes you're gonna have sand what's gonna happen to your feet later on if you kept running with the sand inside your shoes yeah this will cause an inflammation of your skin so try to imagine here I have crystals like the sand but this time between my articulating bones so what's gonna happen to those to the cartilage and the bone articulating in the affected joint it will become the cartilage and bone will become irritated will get inflamed and this what will this is how it's gonna look like those crystals might become huge and will form what we call the two five like the ones that you see on here on the right side of the slide see inflammation of the joint this is due to the accumulation of the uric acid but where do we get the DNA and RNA do we eat DNA and RNA what do you think do we eat DNA and RNA yeah we eat everything that we eat everything is formed of cells every cell has DNA and RNA so if you're eating chicken you're ingesting thousands and thousands of copies of the DNA of this chicken if you're eating beans you're ingesting thousands and thousands of copies of the DNA of the beans and so on so you are ingesting all the time large amounts of DNA and with every cell that you eat you're getting a copy of, it, of the DNA so what do you think you we should be recommending patients with high uric acid resulting in gouty arthritis first thing to avoid avoid any high any food with high uric acid content like what like sardines like liver like kidneys so why because they have lots of cells they have large number of cells small cells and each cell has dna rna that would be digested and would be producing uric acid and this increases the uric acid in the bloodstream resulting in the formation of 
those uric acid crystals to find in the joint. What else would we be recommending those patients with you with all with gouty arthritis? We usually recommend them to drink lots of water. Why we need to drink lots of water to enhance the kidney filtration. When you enhance the kidney filtration, getting more water pushes your your blood through the filtration membrane, filtering larger amounts of your blood into the kidney. And this allows you to get rid of large amounts of uric acid. We're also going to be recommending them to not drink alcohol. Why do you think? First, first thing, alcohol is going to be breaking down some of your cells, cause irritation. Ethanol also will increase the uric acid content. So here I'm increasing the uric acid content either by eating sardines, fish, or liver, or kidney. At the same time, if I'm drinking alcohol, this will increase my uric acid in the blood. So we try to avoid anything that increases the uric acid in the blood. In case of a gouty arthritis attack, if I have an ongoing inflammation of the joint usually gives them anti-inflammatory drugs and if the case is not resolved by using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs we're gonna go ahead and give them corticosteroids and this this completes our session for today all right good luck and we'll see you next time